Hello and welcome to my new series on artificial intelligence. My name is Akram Ahmed. I will be taking you through a journey where you can learn about artificial intelligence and what does artificial intelligence mean. We will be doing a lot of work over here uh, and defining some models for you for artificial intelligence that are used to actually do some intelligent uh, decision making. And we will be using Python basically to uh, give you some hands-on experience on how you can actually work with artificial intelligence. So without further ado, let's start. So what is artificial intelligence? Artificial intelligence is a theory of development, okay? What, what do we develop? We want to develop a computer system, okay? So what we basically want to do, we want to develop a computer system that can perform things or tasks that normally require human intelligence, okay? So we want human intelligence-like behavior for a computer system. To do that, we need first to do some type of visual perception because the humans usually perceive things. We can perceive things using different ways. We can perceive using the eyes, using the ears. So we want the computers to have sensors that can copy the, uh, the functionality of these sensors that we have. Just like the eyes might have cameras for the a microphone for the ears or whatever type of data that we like to sense. We would like to have a sensor that can actually sense it. We would also like it to do some speech recognition so that if we give it commands, for example, if I want to order pizza, it can actually uh, recognize what I'm saying and continue my order and try to help me with any tasks that I want to do. And then after we can take the data input and we can process it, we want it, most importantly, to take a decision, okay? So decision-making is the step that we want the computer to take, and the decision-making should be of an equivalent intelligent human that who uh, that has taken the same uh, path or the same information. The computer should take the same uh, decision that the human would take, and we want it to translate between languages. Now the languages might be the known spoken languages and might be other languages like facial expression or the tone of the voice that you're talking with. It has to be translated. All of these has to be translated. Uh, and then we want the computer to be able to copy all of these so that we can see uh, a human-like behavior, okay? So this is basically a small definition of AI. Now having said that, this definition might change by time, but this is now something, well, most probably, most people will agree that this is what the uh, artificial intelligence generally is talking about. So let's talk about what is basically artificial intelligence, okay? And wh where do we actually use this artificial intelligence? So artificial intelligence is used in many, many, many places, okay? So if you are looking for a virtual assistant or a chatbot, okay, you might have been talking uh, or chatting with some company and that company might have a chat box where it actually replies to you and tries to solve your problem. Okay, so many companies are going towards that and artificial intelligence is playing a big role in that. It is also used in agri agriculture and farming. So basically when you have uh, a farm that you want to know how much water it should go into the, uh, how much water should be using, what, what's a good time to water the, these plants, you might have sensors installed into the into the soil and then the sensors data will be collected and all the data based on how much moisture is there on the uh, in the sand or, or in the in the soil basically you will basically start the sprinklers or you might uh, have sensors to see if there are pests so you can spray pesticide or whatever uh, is used in, our, in, in, in in farming so it's very heavily used in farming it is also used in autonomous flying so if you want to fly a, a uh, a plane, a UAV, or whatever you want. It is used heavily over there to take decisions of what to do and how to avoid obstacles, for example. Uh, it's going between mountains or something, uh, or in a dangerous trail. We also use it in retail and shopping uh, and fashion, basically. So you, you know the big online shopping stores. They're all using such things. Uh, and we also use it for security and surveillance where cameras are basically recording the faces of humans walking by, for example, and then trying to identify people and then categorize those people based on uh, information that they have. If they want to uh, predict that somebody is basically uh, uh, happy or sad, for example, if they want to do that, they can actually do that using the artificial intelligence algorithms. Okay. Sports and Altex is used a lot. So basically, if you want to make a team and you want to see if two players can work together or not. This is one area that artificial intelligence is also working in. 
manufacturing and production is another area where manufacturers are basically using AI algorithms uh, to in improve manufacturing capabilities. Uh, it's also used in livestock management, okay? So if you have um, a, a livestock and you'd like to manage the inventory and all the other things, they use something like uh, an artificial intelligence machine to be capable of taking decisions that are more rational than the other uh, decisions that are taken by just having an if and else statement, for example. Uh, Self-driving cars, basically using a lot of artificial intelligence to detect objects, uh, pedestrians walking, uh, buildings, traffic lights, speed limits, all of this is taken by, you know, taken care by artificial intelligence. It's also used in uh, heavily in the healthcare and medical imaging analysis. So they're using artificial intelligence to work with uh, the x-rays, the MRIs, or all the other data that comes out to detect cancer or detect any abnormalities are there. And it's been proven that uh, by the aid of artificial intelligence, the, uh, uh, the healthcare service provider can actually detect more and more problems because we put the experience and we teach the artificial intelligence things that sometimes the human eyes might uh, overlook, but the computer will look at it and will uh, tell the expert, hey, I found something, and then the expert can take a decision on that, okay? Warehousing and logistics and supply chain, it's heavily used over there. We have some of the online uh, giants that are using this to basically uh, do the warehousing and put the stuff in the warehouse, and that reduces their cost. Uh, and basically, we say artificial intelligence could be used in any area uh, where you would like the machine to perform some reasoning, okay? If you want reasoning by a machine, then artificial intelligence is your uh, area that you want to look at, okay? So, going further, what we will discuss over here in this, we will discuss the history of AI and then we'll go through over some definitions uh, so that we are clear. And then we will talk about human brains. Now, this is not a biology course, but we will take snapses of that. And uh, we'll talk about what this course is going through. So the history of artificial intelligence actually started from 1950s. Okay, so in the 1950s, basically, Alan Turner wrote the Turing test. And we're going to talk about the Turing test. And that was the, uh, the Turing test. That is the key point where artificial intelligence started because he laid the foundation in which the humans can actually determine uh, the difference between artificial intelligence and the human intelligence, okay? Then in the 1960s, uh, there was the step written towards the artificial intelligence, and in the late 1960s also came the symbolic integration uh, the symbolic integration was a very uh, big a breakthrough. So you could actually do an integration problem. You can give it to a computer and symbolically it can solve it. And then in the 1970s, it turned to an expert rule systems. Uh, and then later on uh, in the 1980s and 1990s, we have the deep blue system where the world champion chess uh, played against the computer and the computer was able to beat him. So the, the artificial intelligence advanced to that level. And nowadays we have robotics, computer vision, natural language processing, deep learning, and all the other nice areas of computer working with data and using artificial intelligence basically to solve those issues. Okay, so we'll talk about all of these in this, uh, in this class. So let's talk about the Turing test. What is basically the Turing test? The Turing test, simply what... Uh, what it states is that if, if in case you were sitting over here, so this is me, okay? So let me write me over here. So I am sitting over here and I have a wall separating between me and two different uh, uh, things. One is an actual human. So this is an actual human who is chatting with me or performing the task. And this is basically a machine represented by the, uh, by the key at the back where we're turning the key so that it can actually operate. So... Uh, the, the Turing test basically says if I interact with a human and I interact with the machine, if the machine can react just like a human and I cannot tell the difference between the human and the machine, I have achieved artificial intelligence. Okay? So the basic thing is that can you actually tell who is a machine and who is a human? If you can say that, 
And if you can't tell which one is a machine, then artificial intelligence actually failed. And if you cannot tell whether it's a machine or a human that is sitting on the other side, then basically artificial intelligence has succeeded. Just think of the chat, uh, chat bots that you actually talk with. And if you are ordering something online and you did not get it and you try to chat with the uh, customer service, most often you're chatting with a, a chat bot. And the chatbot, sometimes you don't even know that this, you are chatting with a chatbot. You think it's a human, uh, and then uh, it actually resolves your problem, and you don't even know about it, okay? So the Turing test basically laid a foundation in which we can compare, okay? And we tell whether we have artificial intelligence or not. So a bit of a history over here. Uh, so in the history, basically what we wanted, uh, uh, what happened is in the 1980s when artificial intelligence started picking uh, some, uh, some momentum, it was all about thinking rationally. So we wanted to make machines that can actually think rationally and that's where all the research actually was uh, conducted and it was all concerning about thinking and thinking and thinking. Then in the 1990s, we had a shift. In the 1990s, we had the artificial intelligence. We wanted it to act like people, okay? So we had our research shifted or all the work actually shifted to act like people. In the 2000s until now, we want them to think and act rationally, okay? So you can actually look at it from the, uh, from the movies that you actually see. Uh, for example, in the 1990s, you have the... Uh, the movies that are coming out on, on those types, they were all concentrating on the machines being looking like human and acting like human. So it's all acting like human. Whereas when you see the, the, the new movies coming out in the 2000s, uh, you, you can actually see that the, the machines are not actually looking like human, but they are thinking and doing some rational decision and they are assisting human beings in doing uh, the daily activities, okay? So this is basically a, a paradigm shift that has happened in the 1990s and 2000, okay? And maybe uh, in 10 years of time, we will have a new type of approach where we will add some new things in the future. So let's, take about, let's talk about some definitions. So an agent is one thing. So we'll talk first about an agent. What do we mean by an agent? An agent is a thing that takes inputs using sensors and acts based on these inputs, okay? So anything that can take an input and act upon it is called a sensor. Think of a, a vacuum cleaner, for example, and a small vacuum cleaner that is autonomous or robot that is doing vacuum cleaning. Uh, this is called an agent, okay? Any, any, anything that can actually take an input and can do some actions is called an agent, okay? And this is how we will refer to it within this course. There is something also called the utility over here. So the utility basically is a preferred outcome or result, okay? So this is what we want to achieve. This is the preferred outcome that we want to use. Uh, it's the preferred outcome. So we might have different outcomes coming out and with the, the highest utility will be for the most preferred outcome. So we'll assign a utility, a value to the outcomes and the preferred outcome will have the highest utility. That is basically what a utility is, okay? So example, an agent's preference over possible outcomes can be captured by numbers. So what we try to do is we try to take the outcomes that can, can do and then we translate it to numbers. Now why to numbers? Because at the end we have to work with computers and computers work with numbers. They work with zeros and ones. So we want to take the utility, whatever output that we have, and we have to translate it to numbers. The higher the number, the more the agent likes that outcome, okay? so. Basically, this is what we want. For example, if we're cleaning using a vacuum cleaner, if we get a spotless room that is perfectly clean, we give it a utility, for example, of one. And if it's a completely dirty room, we give it a utility of zero. And then we leave the, uh, the agent over there, and then we ask it to work. If we get 100% clean, we say you achieved a utility of one. If we say, oh, you did a, a lousy job, maybe uh, it missed a few spots here and there, we might say it's 50%, 80%, depending on the uh, the cleanness that that agent actually could have achieved, okay? So this is basically a utility. Now we'll talk about the rationale, okay? So rationale means 
maximally achieve the best utility. So it tries to maximize the best utility and to achieve it. For the example of the vacuum cleaner robot, it will try to maximize and reach 100% or one basically in the cleanliness after it performs its tasks, okay? So this is what the agent or what that machine is targeting. Rationality uh, is nothing but the state of being reasonable, sensible, and having good sense of judgment, okay? So we give these numbers to the agents and then the agents will work on maximizing the utility and when he tries to maximize an utility we say it's a rational agent okay uh, okay so rationality is basically concerned with the expected actions and the result depending upon that agent has perceived okay so it depends on what the agent has perceived and the actions that were done okay performing actions with the aim of obtaining a useful information is important for rationality so you have to perform an action to increase your utility otherwise we should not take that action we, if you want the room to be cleaner i should move to a place which is dirty and then clean it rather than go into a place that is clean and clean it okay so that's rationale and at the end we'll talk about the rational agent and the rational agent is one that acts so that to achieve the best outcome. So the rational agent, we call a rational agent, is the agent that will achieve the maximum utility. Uh, of course, when there is uncertainty, the best, it will try to maximize, it will not reach to one to 100%, but when there is uncertainty in it, it will try to maximize it and push it as hard as possible, maybe go to 90%, 95, 99, whatever it can actually achieve based on the uncertainty that it has. So a rational agent often has clear preferences. Okay, so it has to have a clear preferences, models uncertainty, so it has to model uncertainty. You do not know where the dirt is gonna come into the room, for example, in a, in a busy room where people are going and coming, in a, for example, in a company, you don't know where the dirt will actually fall down, but it's uncertain, but it is within the room and you will act on a decision to go and clean that room and the spot where it has the dirt to maximize your utility, okay? So that will become a rational agent, okay? So this is basically the definitions that we want to talk about. Now let's talk about human brains. Now, as I said, this is not a biology class, so we're not gonna go into the details, but human brains basically are, number one, are very, very good. Number one, they are very good in making rational decision, okay? Uh, we don't know actually how we actually do this rational decision, but we do perform, and we are the best actually in performing rational decisions, okay? So we take rational decisions. But the brain, we do not, we still do not understand how it completely works. So the difficulty is over here, how can we take our behavior and program a computer to copy our behavior when we don't understand how we do things? For example, if I tell you three multiply by four, you will immediately say 12. There is something that happened in our brain. We don't know how it happened. When I ask you for a rational decision, when I give you a different situation, and then I tell you what is the most rational decision I can take. You will think about it for a minute and then you will give me a rational decision. For example, when you're driving a car uh, and you are going on a, uh, on a road that is having a speed of 100 kilometers per hour, for example, and you've missed your appointment or you have a doctor's appointment, you want to get there as fast as you can, your rational decision would be you will never go beyond 100. Now, this decision was taken by your brain and we do not know exactly how this decision came across over there and it came to your brain. You might sometimes uh, take a rational decision and you will deviate from the normal logic a bit due to the situation that you have. For example, if you were drowning and you find a, a life vest, for example, you will do some, un, uh, some things that you will not do normally to try to reach to that life vest and grab it, okay? But that will be the rational decision at that time. So the rationality, rationality basically might change definition from time to time, from situation to situation. And we do not know how human beings interpret this 
uh, as basically uh, and how the brain actually works to uh, to try to compute the output of the rationality. Okay, so this is very very tough. So the job of an artificial intelligence uh, programmer or a person who is actually uh, looking at the artificial intelligence and he wants the machine to be uh, to become intelligent is basically first understand how the humans do it and then make the machine do it in the same or in the same manner okay so brains basically have a huge amount of data in them okay so imagine anything that you have seen heard touched tasted smelled from your childhood till now everything is stored in your brain this is a big amount of data that you have and you use this data to take your rational decision on it okay for example if you give a small boy who's taking hot milk for the first time and he drinks that hot milk and burns his, his face or his lips or tongue next time you're going to give him a hot milk he's not going to drink it even if you give him hot uh hot water and he can actually see for example the steam coming out of it he will be reluctant on trying that uh, because he has seen a hot milk and how the steam was coming out of it and he will see the hot water and he will be basically able to relate the that this both look like the same and they're hot and he's using all that knowledge that he has uh, to actually take that decision. So the amount of data that we have in our brains is, is huge, okay? Uh, we can simulate things, we can compute, we can predict the outcomes based on available data. So if I take you on an edge of a cliff and I take you to take a step forward and you're just standing at the edge, you will never, never, ever take that step, okay? You will never take the step because why? Because you know that if you take the step, you are going to fall. And when you fall, you're going to hurt yourself. And from your history, hurting yourself was bad. And hence, you will not take that step, okay? So this is basically very important. Uh, so we human beings, we can unroll consequences. We can, if I tell you, that I was going in a car uh, at a speed of, like, so let's suppose, uh, 50 kilometers per hour, and suddenly, uh, a meter away, there was a wall in front of me, okay? And I stopped. Now, you can unroll the events in your brain. You will unroll the event that the driver will go and push the brakes. His speed is so high. It's only one meter away. He will not be able to reach it. He's going to crash. Uh, the airbag might open in the car, the driver might get hurt, if there are passengers, they might get hurt. All of this is something that we can unroll the consequences is part of our human uh, behavior, okay? So all of these things are things that we have to copy into the machine. And that is why artificial intelligence sometimes become a bit difficult to implement, okay? So... Uh, I have given some ideas on how human brain actually works. Now let's talk about this course. In this course, you will get to introduce to a suite of representations that will help you make programs that are intelligent. Okay, so we will teach you in these course or in the series of the classes that we're going to have, uh, the videos, uh, the video classes that we're going to have. We're going to teach you how to make a program intelligent. Okay, and we will give you tools so that you can apply them in any field that you want. Uh, so whether you are in the, in the business field or you are in the, uh, in the medical field or whatever field you have, you will have tools over here that you can apply and use a computer to basically take intelligent decisions on your behalf. Okay, we will use representation to model uh, a problem and come up with useful solutions uh, and predictions, okay? So we will use uh, representation. So we'll teach you how to represent data in a way that you can utilize it to take a decision. So the representation is the first thing that you'll have to learn. And then once you represent the data in the right format, in the right way, then you can actually take the decision based on those patterns that you see in those data, okay? Uh, you will uh, you will cons uh, construct you'll learn how to construct algorithms you will learn how to, uh, uh, construct algorithms you'll learn the constraint problems so if you have a problem that you have a constraint in it 
you will learn how to expose those constraints onto the problem and utilize that to your benefit. Uh, we will use perception basically, and we will facilitate thinking, perception, and action taking even for the human being, okay? So as you learn in this course, you might be getting more and more clear ideas on things that you uh, can actually uh, do in your life because you have learned something within this course. So the first example that we're going to go to is the perception example to give you the power of perception. Uh, and in a uh, perception example, we have a person who has one pet lion, one pet lamb, and a bundle of grass. And he wants to basically cross a river, but there is only one boat and it can't sustain the weight of more than two articles at the same time, okay? So this is a problem that most of you might have played with your friend or something like that. So I'm going to start with this. So basically what we want to do, we want to take the sheep, the lion, the grass to the other side. However, we have to take one item at a time because I am going to be sitting and rowing the boat or you are going to be sitting and rowing the boat. So you can only take one item at a time. And we would like to take everything without the lion eating the sheep, without the sheep eating the grass. Okay. So the question then will become, if you can, how, how will we get to the other side? So this is the first question that we're going to answer. And once we know the answer, the problem then will be how we can get a computer program to do that. So it's not you who's going to take the decision. Now we want a program to take a decision. And how are we going to do that? This is something that we're going to learn over here. Okay. So the bigger question is, how would you tell a computer? The human being, we have intelligence. We can actually think about it, sit for 15 minutes or 20 minutes and try to solve it. And we can say, oh, we'll take this first, take that, and then, 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 and we will come up with a solution. However, how would you tell a computer to come up with a solution? That is the main task. So we can start this problem by stating how many possible ways are there to solve such a problem? Okay. Is it one way? Is it two ways? There are a hundred ways. Let's, let's try to think when, when we raise these questions, your brain starts working and it actually tries to process all these data. And then it comes up with a method to find the answer. So first we have to understand the problem. Okay. Now I'm going to go step by step in this example so that you guys do not have issues in understanding the problem. And then I will show you how to actually solve it. So let's use visual perception, much one of the most powerful techniques that human beings actually possess. So let's represent it. Let's represent the problem into a shape, a figure like this, where we have a river in the middle and we have the sheep, we have the boat that we are sitting in, we have a lion and we have a grass, okay, a bundle of grass. So we are on one side of the river and we want to go to the other side of the river and the boat can only take one thing at a time. Now we change the problem into a visual perception problem. We call this the starting position where you are at. We call this the initial state. So this is the initial state. In the initial state, I basically am on the left-hand side of the river with all of the items that I have with me on the left-hand side. Okay. So we want to go to something called the final state or the end state or what is your goal? My goal is, or the end state is, I want everything to be on the other side, safe and sound. Okay. Uh, and, uh, I want the, for example, the sheep and, uh, and the lion and the grass without the lion eating the sheep and without the sheep eating the grass. So this is my end state. So I have my initial state, which is like this. And I would like to reach to an end state, which is like this. Okay. So the first question that comes to mind is how many more states or situations are there? You can pause the video over here and try to figure out how many situations are there. Uh, that's a good practice for you and you should be able to do it. And, uh, I'll just tell you, there are 16 more possible ways over here. So if we list all possible outcomes that can be there. So we have the initial state that we have listed. So let's put the initial state over here and we have the final state and we have the new states. I call it state number two, for example, state number three, four, five, I number them. And these are states that I'm putting either sheep is over on the other side, for example, in this state, I'll put it this way, the 
the sheep is over here, whereas I am over here with the lion and the grass, and all the different states that are shown over here are shown in front of you. You can actually look at them, and these are all the states that you can have within this problem. Now, there are 16 states. However, if you look at some states, okay, if you look at some states, you will look and see that there are some states that do not confine or do not satisfy the constraints that we have. What are the constraints that we have? We have one, we cannot leave the lion and the sheep at the same side because the lion is going to eat the sheep. So if you look at this example, the lion is here and the sheep is here. This is a, this is a state that we cannot have because the lion is going to eat the sheep. So we can cross the state out. And then over here, similarly, we can cross this state out. Okay. We cannot have the sheep and the grass at the same time where I'm not there. So I'm on the other side, the sheep will eat the grass. So this is a state that cannot be there. And going on, you can actually eliminate the states. And once you eliminate the states, you will come to something like this. Okay. So I'm basically representing over here all the states that have a problem. You can actually see over here the sheep and the lion are on the same side. Uh, or you might have the sheep and the grass on the same side. If the sheep and the grass are on the same side, you have the purple X. And if you have the sheep and the lion, you have the red X. So once a uh, few of the states might have the two X's together because the sheep will eat the grass and the lion will eat the sheep. Uh, all of this is going to be states that are unusable in your solution because you do not want to reach to this situation, okay, in which some animal eats another animal or its food. So one is the on top of the other's food chain, basically. So we can actually take these states out. Now, these are states that we do not want to read, so let's take them out. So we are left with very few states now. Now we have reduced the problem, and we have these states, and we have the initial state over here, and we have the final state, which is over here. So we have the initial state, and we have the final state. Now the problem becomes, I want to go from the initial states to the final state with a constraint that I can take with me one object at a time. So I can either take the sheep with me at a time or the lion with me at a time or the grass with me at a time. Okay. So from the state, I can only have, I can go to a state where there is only one movement. Okay. So this is one movement, a sheep or a lion or a grass. So I can go from the initial state to one of these three states. I cannot go from the initial state to this state because there are two objects that are over here. Okay. Uh, sorry, there are two. Ob uh, so, uh, for example, I cannot go from this state to this state because there are two objects and you know I can only take one object. Okay. So over here, the second object was the boat and the boat can be at other side. So this is a valid state actually. Uh, but over here, I cannot go from the initial state to this state. Okay. Because uh, I cannot take two animals over there and be at this, uh, at this spot, uh, in one step. So I have to have multiple steps to do it. So my first step will be, I have to take one item with me and I am with it on the other side. So once we take that, this is one thing that we can actually do. Okay. And if you look at the other states, there isn't any other state possible that it can actually do. So I have to go from initial state one to state number six. And I can then, from this, I can go and say, oh, then I will come back and then I will go and take, for example, with me, the lion. So when I take the lion with me, I will have the sheep myself and the lion over there and I can actually go to that place. Now, I have a problem. If I leave the sheep and the lion, the lion is going to eat the sheep. So what I have to do is I have to take the sheep back with me to, to the other side of the river. And if you play this uh this game basically that's at in the initial states and rearrange the states you will find that you only have these set of arrangements of states that you can actually perform in which i have only one object shifted with me on the other side either one or no okay so for example from state six to state number two i do not shift any object i just go by myself and in the first from stage one to six, I go with the sheep. So I shift the sheep with me. So two objects are moving. And then afterwards, I have two solutions. So I can take the lion back with me and bring the grass or, and then bring the sheep back and take the lion over here. Okay. And come to the state. 
and I have the sheep over here and then I go back, bring the sheep and I'm on the other side. Or what I could do is actually I can go and take the lion with me and bring the sheep back and then take the grass with me and bring the, uh, and come back by myself and then we go and take the sheep with us to the final state. Okay, so you have only and only these two uh, paths that you have that you can have for this problem. Now, all of these are very simple steps that you can actually program a computer to do, and the computer can do this, and then it can actually play a game that has this issue. Then you can actually increase the number of, uh, uh, of things that you have and the relation between them, and the computer can decide on this. Now, what we have used in this example is visual perception, okay? We used our eyes. We tried to make a state in which we can see, and then we utilized uh, we took a look at all the states, we listed all the states, and in those states, we took out the states that had constraints in them that were not satisfied, just like the lion eating the sheep. We took all of them out, we reduced the problem, and then we came to all the states that are possible, okay? All states that are possible and have no issues, and then we arranged those states based on the constraint that I can only take with me one object or no objects, okay? And once you do that, you come up with the thing that you see on your screen now. Okay, so this is what you come up with. So you see how visual perception can actually help us solve problems. And then we can put the steps for the computer and it can follow the steps that we have programmed it for to get these states and then play this game or help me solve this problem. Another example that I am going to be going over is the uh, algorithm that we call the generate and test in AI. This is basically one of the AI algorithms, which is most probably everybody has used in his life, but you guys don't maybe uh, uh, understand, or most of you do not understand that you actually actually used it. So let's start uh, with an example. Uh, what is the fish in the box? Okay. So we have a box over here. I give you a picture of three of the same fish, three pictures of the same fish, and I tell you, hey, tell me what is the name of this fish. Now, supposedly you are not an expert in fish, okay? And when you look at this, you will not be able to tell. Well, when I looked at it, I was not able to tell uh, what is this fish type. So what would you do in this case, okay? What would you actually do in this case? So you can pause the video for a second over here and think about it and then continue on moving so that you get to know how people are working with such problems. Okay, so let's move on. So before we think AI, let's think how we humans will do it. Now, if I have three pictures and I can see in the pictures, the colors are different, the angles are different. Uh, I basically try to understand what the pictures are, and it's a fish I know. So what would I do? I would go to a source that can actually give me pictures of fish. If you if you want to get this done, you have to have a source that give you a picture of fish. For example, a book that has pictures of fish with the names on it, okay? Or you can go online and you can find a database that has this, so you can actually look at it, uh, extract the pictures, and then compare the two pictures. What we do is we take our pictures and we compare it with the pictures that we have, okay? From the database that we got, from the book that we got. We take the picture that we have on the screen, and in the book, for example, if we're taking a book, an encyclopedia, we, we take the first picture and we compare our fish with it. Most probably, it's not gonna match, okay? Then we say, no, we didn't get a match. So we flip the page. When we flip the page, we have another picture, and in the other picture, we try to map the fish with that picture. And we keep on flipping, keep on flipping, keep on flipping until we get something that looks like this. And once we get something that looks like this, we'll say we got a hit and then we will get the name that is written beneath or next to the picture that's there. Okay. Uh, so this is how we humans would do it. Okay. So we'll try to find a match. What we do, we extract features. What do we do in this picture? We basically look at the picture and say, okay, let's extract features. Now, there are good features for extraction and there are bad features for extraction. Bad feature for extraction, for example, for this fish would be like, it lives in water. It always exists in places that have light. 
all of these features that I'm extracting right now, both of these features are bad features, okay? Uh, a bad feature would be uh, it has a single color, okay? That's a very bad feature because the picture in the middle shows you that it might be multiple colors, okay? So you have to extract features. Another bad feature would be it lives near, near to rock, okay? Uh, I don't know, but I can see rocks over here. So it, it lives near rocks. That might be a bad feature. So you have to extract meaningful features that will enable you to distinguish between the different type of fishes that you're going to be comparing it against. For example, one of the good things to extract over here is the mouth of the fish. So the mouth of the fish over here is very unique. As you can see from the rightmost picture over here, you can actually see the mouth. It's very unique. It's very, very unique. You can actually have it uh, uh, as, a, as a good feature. And the thing, the other thing that we're looking for, the, the shape of the fish looks like a box. The yellow fish over here actually shows you a good yellow box over here. So you can actually take that feature. Oh, these are the feature. You might have a feature. Uh, all of them have spots. So it's a fish that has spots. Okay. So these are good features that you are extracting. And this will help you determine when you're flipping the page to find the best matching fish. Now, when you flip the page or you go through the database, you will not find exactly this picture. You might find a picture that is close to it with maybe a different color, a bigger size fish, uh, something different, but you will compare those different features. And when most of the features match, you will say, hey, this is my fish, and you will get to know what the fish is. So extracting feature is very, very important. Okay. Uh, and we talked about the good features and the bad feature. Each good selected feature should take you closer to the target while the bad features will deviate you from the target, okay? So that's why we have to select very good features, okay? So good features, as it helps us, it will also help computers to identify uniqueness in this fish so that you can distinguish it among the others, okay? So this is the generate and test. This is how it actually works. This is the algorithm. So you have something that generates for you the, the different uh, items that you want. For example, in the fish example over here, this might be the database or the book that you are looking the fish from. So each page will have one fish and it's basically being generated for you. So your generator is generating pictures of fish. Your book is generating pictures by picture for the fish as you flip on the pages. And then each picture you take it and you test it against the features that you have extracted most often what will happen, you will go to a failure. So you will fail. You will say, no, this is not the fish. And you keep on flipping, keep on flipping, keep on flipping, or in the database, going to the next record, next record, next record, until very rarely it will happen because this generator will generate for you a fish that is close to your fish that you have in hand. You will get a match and you will go say, hey, I have succeeded. Okay. I have succeeded. I have found my fish. So this is what we call the generate and test. Whenever we fail, we go back and generate another picture of the fish. And then we go back and test and we fail. And we keep on doing this until we find the fish that we want. Once we find the fish, we say, hey, it's successful. Okay. So boom, over here, we found our fish. You have learned your first algorithm, which is generate and test. Okay. So very powerful algorithm. Uh, a lot of people use it, okay, and uh, mostly 90% of the research starts from this, that we try to look for a solution and we fail and we fail and we fail and we fail, and then we succeed. Uh, suddenly, you might be reflecting to what Edison was saying, that I have failed more than I have succeeded. Why? Because he was trying and use, doing the generate and test model, basically, and he was failing and failing and failing, and then at the hundredth, or I don't know what number he actually stated, he actually was successful in making uh, a light bulb, for example, or whatever he was looking for. So this is basically the generate and test, okay? So you generate all the possible uh, uh, inputs that you can have. Now, for this generator, there has to be some properties for this generator, okay? And what are the properties of the generator? Uh, it should not be redundant. What do we mean by redundant? It should not generate the same thing twice. This is what we mean by redundant. For example, in the example of the fish, if I compare myself to a fish on the first page and I find that it's not the fish, I do not want that fish to be generated again. OK, 
okay? Because I'll be just wasting my time and resources comparing against the same fish. Imagine a book that has 50 pages of the same fish, okay? So you'll be flipping 50 pages and trying to compare and you're just wasting your time. So it should not, there should not be redundancy. There should not be a repetition of the same data that's coming in. So it has, it has to be not uh, the same. Should not generate the same data more than once. Okay, so more than once is the key over here. It should only and only generate it once so I can compare against it and then I can move on to the next one. Okay, it should be informable. This is very important, okay? To supply knowledge related to the matter or subject in hand, it has to be giving you information about the thing that you are targeting. For example, in the fish example, we don't want a book that talks about dinosaurs and uh, the reptiles, for example, that are walking. We know it's a fish. I don't want a picture of a reptile, a picture of a lion coming out, a picture of a dinosaur coming out. I want only and only pictures of fish. It is, has to be informable that it can actually confine itself to the fish only, okay? So don't go to the Encyclopedia of the World and try flipping pages in the Encyclopedia of the World uh, and try to find a fish. Go to an Encyclopedia that's talking about a fish and then flip the pages. That makes more sense. So it should be informable. So it's supplying knowledge related to the matter, okay? Just like the fish, it has to give me pictures of the fish. So these are two properties that are very important in the generator or in the database that you are going to have, okay? So no repetition and it should be informable, talking about the same topic that you are talking about, okay? So you can test uh, fast, so fast uh, speed nowadays is an issue, so you want to test fast. Yes, computers are fast, but we want to reduce the load on them so that they do not perform things that are not necessary to be done. For example, if I have a redundant generator and generating the same picture for me uh, every five or six times I go to the generator and generate the same picture for me of the fish, it's just wasting my time. Okay, I want to take the time to make my algorithm work faster and reach the target so I can do the next step that I want to do. And it has to be very efficient. So comparison should not take very long time. It has to be pretty, pretty fast, okay? Efficient, uh, we're, we're working a lot in efficiency nowadays. So uh, we'll not concentrate too much on the efficiency, but uh, it has to be fast and efficient, okay? And it has to extract meaningful test features to determine the failure versus the success, okay? So if it can uh, extract all of these information, then you can say that you have a very good AI algorithm that is running to basically determine whether it's a fish or not. Now, this is a very primitive type of AI, and we only use this when we don't have any other information, okay? So if it's something that's like, like new, uh, if you are, uh, for example, you never heard of a problem uh, that you are facing, you never knew uh, the fishes like me, I only know names of few fishes, then this basically will be the only thing that I am going to be using. However, if I go to an expert of a fish, he might not be using the generated test method. He might be using the other methods that we will discuss uh, later on in this course, okay? So generate and test, one very powerful method that you have learned. Okay, as a conclusion, uh, we have covered lots of things in this. Uh, we have covered the generate and test, and we have covered using representation and constraint satisfying problem to basically find a solution. Uh, thank you very much uh, for listening to this video and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye-bye.